Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. We have two guests today on the Cognitive Crucible. First is Austin Branch, who is a professor of the practice at the Applied Research Laboratory for Intelligence and Security, and you will hear us refer to that as ARLIS. And joining Austin is Andy Whiskeyman, who is also a professor of the practice at ARLIS. And Andy also holds posts as associate professor at the College of Information and Cyberspace at the National Defense University, and he is also a non-resident fellow at the Joint Special Operations University. Austin and Andy, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you, John. Yeah, John, thanks. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, fellas. Well, thanks for joining. This is uh, going to be a special episode. Uh, for those in our audience that may be unaware, we just wrapped up the Phoenix Challenge in London last week, and this episode is coming out on Tuesday March the 14th, but just a few days ago, we wrapped up the Phoenix Challenge in London event. So I've asked you guys if you could come on and give your hot take, a quick download about what uh, transpired at PC London and uh, some of the major takeaways. Uh, but first, could one of you uh, give a quick 101 on what the Phoenix Challenge Conference Series is for those in our audience who may be unfamiliar. Hey, well, thanks, John. I'll kick it off. Um, so Phoenix Challenge is not a new thing. It was uh, is actually initiated by the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence in uh, 2000 for the purpose of bringing the, the industry and technology community together to help serve the, uh, the evolving information, operations information, warfare community of the time really tied to uh, the Defense Department initiatives to improve uh, our efforts in that regard. In, the, in those days, the Undersecretary for Intelligence was the lead. Um, <clears throat> so it, uh, the actual Phoenix Challenge Conference series and workshop series took a bit of a hiatus during the, uh, during the Department of Defense's kind of uh, uh, re new updated view of conferences and uh, and how they should be run and, and executed. And there were some changes in leadership at the department. And, uh, and that hiatus was well over 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, some colleagues and I uh, recognized that we still had, uh, there were still gaps uh, in our, our broader community of interest, our global enterprise. And, and we, we felt strongly that the only way to really compete against our near peer and, and pacing adversaries and, and those who challenge our interest was to do a few things. One is we had to establish and maintain a network uh, network of network of like-minded organizations, agencies, uh, private sector, academia, governments uh, to really get at uh, some of the challenges. We recognize you had to use the power to convene, to commonly orient the interests of, of many of these uh, organizations and agencies and so forth, and then, um, and and then, and then it'll help us prioritize the capabilities and, and resource application to activate and orient, and 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 really inspire others through shared through collaboration, through some transparencies, through mutual accountability, through this series of conferences and workshops that are not really, the, you know, the mission is not the conference. The mission is is being able to be more competitive and effective in this space to protect our security interests globally, both of our respective uh, countries, for the, the industries that operate in these, in these spaces, and certainly uh, for, uh, for the entire you know, you know, free world uh, uh, enterprise. So to that end, we, over a year ago, Arliss, uh, in coordination and close partnership with others, piloted, uh, uh, piloted the, uh, the Phoenix Challenge effort with uh, a whole bunch of senior leaders and other folks just to kind of uh, 
reaffirm the brand, reaffirm the interest and the appetite for doing just what I said, the network of networks convened to in, uh, orient. And it was, it was overwhelming. And as a result, we were able to have a series of discussions with uh, OSD, uh, DOD, uh, the Office of Information Operations Policy, and, and, and many others. And they recognized that in order to be able to execute the, uh, the strategies, to be able to kind of <clears throat> bring folks together in, in ways that would, uh, you don't have to command and control it, you don't have to own it to integrate it, but in ways that people could share enough information, be engaged, have relationships, so they would go to their respective organizations, be it government, academia, or industry, and then, and then orient their efforts accordingly, consistent with their own interests, but informed enough to understand that, that what they do affects others and affects the global security environment. So, uh, so we, we've had a series of developmental uh, 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 Phoenix challenges, which were uh, you know, increasingly uh, you know, even more you know, effective. Uh, we, we, and Andy will talk to this, that we wanted to make sure that these just weren't meetings. They were action oriented. They were set. They set the foundation of of, of moving forward with, uh, to close gaps and to take actions necessary to make us more effective and to understand ourselves and the threats that face us more clearly. So that's the that was the big idea. We've had uh, we also realized that it's not just a U.S. thing. As I said, it's an all in proposition. We uh, <clears throat> the, our UK friends and partners in the MOD UK recognize the value of this consistent with their own security interests and agreed to partner, not to just be a participant, to no kidding partner with the Department of Defense and others and, and Arliss and, uh, and, uh, and, and organizations like the Information Professional Association were able to help set the conditions to facilitate these engagements. And we just finished London, which was an extraordinary event and uh, it met or exceeded uh, our expectations. Uh, for collaboration, we have uh, we had over seven, eight countries. We had senior leaders from NATO, from from uh, various uh, uh, departments and ministries of defense, of, of uh, foreign office, our State Department senior leaders. We had a uh, and then industry, academia, and government, which are by the way, as Andy will, will outline, those are the kind of three major lines of effort and where they intersect. Is where is where Arliss is is working hard to help support the Phoenix Challenge mission. So um, so again, uh, this is uh, <clears throat> this is an extraordinary effort for us uh, to be able to be part of it. But it would never happen without the support of organizations like the Information Professional Association, working directly with the private sector and industry to be able to bring the kind of uh, the in, the interested industry partners. Remember, they're a line of effort. And be able to uh, to uh, uh, to be able to bridge uh, the relationships um, and to uh, and and help industry support efforts like uh, like Phoenix Challenge, and uh, which to be able to not only put on great events uh, like we have like we had in London, but to also expose government to you know uh, you know innovation and new technologies which we don't, you know, we don't normally see in our silos. So, uh, you know, that's the macro view, um, but uh, to get into the details and to, and to better understand the outputs and outcomes and desires of this construct, let me turn it over to my, uh, my great colleague, uh, Dr. Andy Wistman. Hey, thank you, Austin, uh, for that, that level set of the vision and the participation within Phoenix Challenge. And, uh, I am honored to have been a part of the resurrection of Phoenix Challenge uh, in coordination with some of the efforts that were going on within the department already. You know, many of us noticed the, the gap that had occurred. Uh, having been a little bit younger in service at the time, living through it, we recognized a need as well at a grassroots level. You know, Austin talked about that high level recognition of needing to convene a community of interest around this particularly vexing topic, and one that is crucial to our national security, not only of the United States, but also of our close allies and partners. And so bringing together this group to not just admire the problem. I don't know about you, but I've been to many sessions where there's a lot of talk about the nature of the problem, resourcing issues, bringing technologies, 
issues forward, partnering issues, the challenges of facing what our adversaries are doing, but then no outcomes, no deliberate outcome, no accountability, as Austin mentioned, to ourselves to move this effort forward in a meaningful way. It was in fits and starts. And so talking through this, particularly with senior leaders across the field and our key partners in this space and our allies, we really wanted to have something meaningful in the outcome. And that's not to get 100% right out the gate, but that's that start putting objectives out, getting guidance from senior leaders on those objectives, and then reporting back with a set periodicity on the progress that we're making, either identifying games we've made, new goals that need to be set, or where we have shortfalls in either personnel, training, education, resources, to be able to then make those requests in coordination with set cycles that already occur within, for our sake, the Department of Defense. That's incredibly necessary and something that had been lacking in this. That's the intent, one of the intents of bringing this group together. The other thing that it does is it brings together policymakers and practitioners to be able to have open and candid dialogue in a trusted environment about the real challenges and opportunities that we face. Both sides I have found in my time often bemoan the other, not because the one side is not doing good work, but because they don't have the time to connect. Austin mentioned silos, those, those cylinders of excellence, right, that we fall into need to be cross-pollinated. This is a mechanism to be able to do that cross-pollination. And then when you add in industry and academia, my goodness, there's a million good things going on in industry when it comes to innovation and technology. There's an incredible amount of research that academics are pouring into this field. Well, how do we take the most salient points from that and get them to the folks that need it and then figure out ways to pilot new programs, to test, to be entrepreneurial in our approach to this? That's the strength of a Western approach. That's the strength of an American effort is we bring together a whole of society to tackle the challenges that we face. And while it may be a little slow to start than some of our autocratic adversaries, it's nonetheless much more powerful in the long term. And that's what Phoenix Challenge does, in particular for information in support of national level objectives. I'll, uh, I'll stop there for follow on questions or, uh, or any other thoughts that the follow Boston wants to have. Let me, let me punctuate and foot stomp uh, something Andy had mentioned is uh, we're, when you talk about neutral ground, one of the key characteristics of Phoenix Challenge is, and we use the analogy of a watering hole, right? Uh, where, where everyone can come and benefit from coming to the watering hole. They could set their equities aside and because everyone has equities. You know, they have their own missions and their own resources and they want to protect those. We, we get it. Sometimes, uh, and, and I think many of you, particularly in the information space who work in this space, understand some of the, the challenges associated with uh, maintaining credibility and relevance, maintaining budgets, uh, protecting the equity. And sometimes those competitions, those efforts sometimes outweigh uh, focus on the bigger prize and the bigger prize is to be even more competitive against our adversaries. And, and, and so we should be, you know, Andy and I would argue we need to be focused on the horizon and look at the details and how we get to, uh, to achieve those objectives rather than, you know, the, 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 the competition amongst the silos of all the various actors in the information space. And we're trying to break through that. So we want to have the watering hole of people feel comfortable uh, coming in and engaging and doing the things that Andy just outlined. That's not just governments, <laughs> but imagine the private sector outside of just the defense industry enterprise. Those sectors in the private sector that are doing their own thing for the creative arts and entertainment industry, financial industry, uh, medical service, they, they, they all touch our information bar. They have influence. They have pathways. They have relationships. They're, uh, they're agents of influence. I mean, we, we, we need to they need to feel welcome and that their views, their technologies, the innovation, all that is, is respected and, and wants, you know, we want to learn from that and utilize that. Look, there's no, it's no mystery that innovation and technology 
uh, development is happening really more so outside of our respective government institutions. And we're doing some great works in the labs and doing some great work, but there's some extraordinary, exquisite work going on outside. And we want to be able to be able to <clears throat> allow them a pathway uh, to engage with uh, with us in the security, uh, you know, working hard to ensure the security of our respective nations and our uh, our, our global security interests. So I just want to make uh, reinforce that point. We, we want to make sure it's it's neutral ground. So yeah. uh, any questions, John? Or and I was just going to jump in on the trust issue, and then we'll turn it over to John, uh, so we don't hide the podcast. But uh, that that trust is so important. And you know, a good friend of mine, retired Marine General Tom Drowdy, uh, had told me, "Hey, you know, Andy, just remember, you can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to be there." There's a je ne sais quoi. I've exhausted my French on being present and the beauty of bringing the group together it starts to build trust outside of our own tribes and so one of the things and i know we want to talk about london a little bit but one of the beauties was the invitation to some folks that don't typically come to these events right and there's a lot of brilliance going on in many sectors that don't have a tradition or a memory of spending time with those in uniform or those in government and breaking bread together in London you know, was a way to start building that trust so we can have the kind of conversations that we need to have. That's absolutely vitally important. Yeah, let's leverage technology like we're doing now with this podcast. That's a brilliant thing. But there's very human element to this and being present to that is so vitally important to moving this whole enterprise forward. Right, well, uh, thanks fellas. And I, I was remiss at the top actually from uh, extending a, a thank you to Arliss. Yeah, IPA is so grateful to Arliss uh, and the relationship that we have with Arliss and uh, being a part of this Phoenix Challenge conference series. So uh, th thank you to you guys as well. Um, well, perhaps we can start uh, stepping into some of the major themes and uh, takeaways from this, this last evolution, which, as I mentioned at the top, just concluded in London. Uh, could one of you start unpacking that a little bit? Yeah, that, absolutely. Uh, there's, I'm going to cover this in two, two broad areas uh, and then dive a little bit deeper into both of those. The first one was, yes, in the plenary sessions, bringing together some luminaries and some senior leaders to commonly orient the group, the shared vision, the shared challenges that we face. It was vitally important leading into the third day where we got into the smaller working groups to start tackling the how. You know, it's one thing to say we have a challenge with, for instance, disinformation and the deluge of disinformation, or as, as Rand, I think, has quoted, the fire hose of falsehood, right? But then what do you do about it? If you just identify, hey, this is a problem and walk away, it doesn't actually solve anything. And so breaking into those smaller groups to roll up one's proverbial sleeves and start wrestling with the hows. What resources do we have? What capabilities do we have? Where is their expertise that we can bring into this? What are the challenges that we face? And then how do we meaningfully address those was absolutely critical, not only for day three, but also for the carry on conversation. This is meant to continue the dialogue and the work in between the Phoenix Challenge, I call them marquee events, uh, which works both with uh, North American uh, English, where it's a, kind of a big headline event, and with British English, where it's, designed, it's a tent, a big tent. Both of those meanings of marquee work in terms of bringing that group together, um, you know, Austin's metaphor of the watering, watering call with that. So the first group of work with that was the working groups with industry and government discussions, academia discussions, and then the kind of the government only working some things out in between and amongst uh, itself. So in the industry and government working group, that was really designed to have open dialogue and to bring more clarity to how does government request and ask for the things that it needs? How does industry and all of the innovation that's going on meet government with the innovations that's developing or get clarity on what government seeks, sees as a problem and then be able to work research on that to come back with solutions. How do we do that in a more meaningful way 
than some of the archaic ways that we've been working that worked in the past. It worked for industrial age warfare, but it doesn't work with information and doesn't work at the speed with which we need for cognitive uh, application. Not that cognitive has ever not been a part of warfare, but it's really coming to an understanding in the forefront once again. So how do we move at speed with that? The second piece was the academic. And that was really bringing the community together and getting ready for the this year's academically themed session in June. We don't know ourselves. We have to know ourselves. We have to know our adversary. Ancient wisdom, right? We like to quote Sun Tzu. But how do you actually do that? It's easy to say, well, you need to know yourself. Well, gathering that academic community to start understanding where are the points of research? Where are the connections already? Who's working in this field? where we can bring together the techno, uh, technological research that's going on and the cognitive research that's going on together. And then start working forward on where do we have gaps where government has a problem, for instance, that we need to partner with academia or we can partner with uh, focusing research. There's a whole host of things that can be done across civilian universities and military universities in terms of harnessing the power there to start working on solving some of our uh, challenges that we face. And then the third piece was the, the government day, uh, work groups. That leads into the second block of work for outcomes. And the government session is focused on integrated deterrence, which all deterrence is always integrated and it's cognitive in nature, right? But focusing on how, how does information really help form the bedrock of understanding deterrence theory and what we do about that. Narrative, a lot of talk about narrative, but really what is narrative and how do we harness that power or how do we understand what our adversary is trying to do either to set their own or to undermine ours? Assessments, which has been a continual challenge in this field of assessing either causality or correlation of the actions that we take. How do we articulate to senior leaders the return on investment for the dollars they spend in the information fight to assure that they're meeting their objectives. Not just hand-waving the problems, but real meaty, quantifiable and qualifiable metrics that with the same rigor we would apply to other fields. We ought to be applying to this field to measure back. And then finally, thinking through the battle rhythm for this. Now by that, I mean, where do you set the, the periodicity on your calendar of when you're gonna meet virtually, when you're going to meet face to face, what's the group that's going to get together? What's the focus? What meetings are already going on that you need to share in inputs and outputs with so that you start really putting this all together to build a sense of shared situational awareness? Just holding working groups for their own sake is meaningless. It thieves oxygen. They ought to be tied to some sort of outcome. And really that was the working group that was designed to start understanding ourselves, who's already doing work and where can we take advantage of work that's already going on? So we don't, we're not duplicative in what we're trying to do. We actually add value in this process by being that connective tissue between these events and being the community that senior leaders can go to, to get that shared sense of awareness and to motivate the entire force by the guidance they can provide here that then will filter out uh, and be able to capture that, that latent capacity in the workforce that we have in the creative community that we have. And I'll pause there, John, for, uh, for questions. Or Austin, if you have any follow-up on any of those points. Yeah, just, uh, just some examples of outputs. Um, as many of you know, and Andy already highlighted, uh, in, in certainly in our U.S. Department of Defense and some of our services, uh, while we have a great silos of, uh, of development for like cyber, for electronic warfare, and for some of the other, you know, key, you know, uh, capabilities that, uh, that contribute to this, the broader information space in, in significant ways. Sometimes the major, they are the platforms for influence that, uh, that uh, we utilize. But at the intersection of hard science and soft science, the intersection of cyber, MSO, cognitive science, there's really no one organization or agency responsible for managing the, you know, the capability development 
for husbanding, you know, how those intersect, where, where that, where those get developed. And there's really been no um, overarching repository for the, for the great work that Andy already mentioned. It's already going on. There's a ton of stuff that's out there. We've recognized that uh, have direct, uh, direct application or adjacent application to the, to close, uh, to meet some of the requirements and to solution some of the challenges. You know, how, how do we expose folks to that? During this Phoenix Challenge, I watched and I've seen in the immediate several days after, uh, you know, Air Force presenting uh, some of the activities they're doing in the te technology space to support operations in the information environment broadly. I've, we've, seen, we've seen great discussions about training environments and about other efforts that have been in development that were unknown to some of our other government colleagues. And certainly it informed, helped inform the industry on how might they, you know, might improve all of that. There have been no less than two dozen interactions, I mean, significant interactions since the London event between government industry and government organizations themselves that were that were illuminated during the during these work uh, work groups and that that wouldn't have happened before so i take um, great pleasure and satisfaction in seeing those percolate and what we do as andy pointed out we don't live from one conference or workshop to another we're constantly working the relationships in between we're we're uh we're keeping the fire going and uh as as we help the network expand and to, and to grow some roots. Uh, we also, uh, as I said, as Andy said, there's great stuff going on already. How do we, how do we provide a mechanism for folks to snap link in, right? And this, this we're finding is in fact, it's helping. It helps reconcile some of these efforts and, and frankly, optimize some of the resource investment. And we're having some of those discussions just yesterday between uh, an Air Force and an Army element who were, by the way, just, you know, working uh, uh, efforts related to synthetic training in the information environment, nesting the cognitive aspects into the hard science and cyber aspects of training. They, they were introduced at Phoenix Challenge and now working toward advancing those efforts for their respective services, but it's good for the Department of Defense that they're doing that. So that, those are just some quick examples to highlight what Andy was talking about. John? One of the goals of this podcast forum is to open the aperture, right? Uh, to uh, it, it, it's a much bigger problem than you know just the U.S. DOD or the U.S. Uh, national security uh, community. So I, I guess the kind of question I want to ask you guys is, what kind of engagement would you like to see more of? What kinds of organizations? could plug into this effort who are not currently plugged in? Um, John, um, we have, uh, we've extended our uh, reach, the network of networks I talked about. And as I mentioned to the entertainment and creative arts industry out in Hollywood and in New York, there are multinational corporations who have, uh, you know, global influence that, uh, that, that could play a role in supporting this broad effort. Imagine, uh, not only technology firms, but fossil fuel, uh, major OEMs that have strategic influence across the globe. Uh, they have investment that uh, that can move that can be oriented on on these uh, on on efforts that we believe that uh, would support uh, information related objectives. And um, so we, as a, we mentioned, we really want to be the watering hole for all of that. We also kind of play this interesting kind of match.com. You know, we, uh, if folks, and, and I'm fielding, after London, I'm feeling many dozens of emails of folks asking for introductions, government asking to meet with. So we, we're facilitators of the relationships, uh, which is part of our role. And, uh, and we want to be able to expand that into, uh, into other interested partner, parties who are, would be, that are critical to uh, the global security environment in the information space, but as as uh, both Andy and I've mentioned, are not uh, you don't have the relationships, don't have uh, comfort level, um, and engaging in in uh, in these spaces. So we're designing Andy and I and and several other leaders are designing and working with OSD and others and State Department and NATO to design um, smaller workshops at at more senior levels that would 
be very comfortable to those folks that uh, that wouldn't normally engage with us, but are critical uh, to these efforts. Imagine, uh, um, you know, multinational corporations that operate in social media, and uh, and and uh, and others that have a global influence and global impact. Andy, to that I'd add just just uh, two things from my perspective. Uh, the first is deeds and words have to match as a philosophy. If we want to have a shared sense of understanding or we want our adversaries to understand what it is that we're doing, that's absolutely critical as a building block. That applies not only to the Department of Defense, but it's throughout industry. In fact, it's every person, any relationship you're in, the things you do and the things you say have to match for somebody to trust what it is that, that you're saying and doing. Well, to the extent that we can open the tent more for who ought to come to these events, it, it's, it's really open to everybody. As Austin mentioned, all of those corporations, the multinational ones, even national ones, have a role to play with information and an understanding in this space that they would gain by participating in an information conference. We particularly called it an information conference because information is very broad. It's not just influence. It's not just cyber. It's information. And we all touch that. Particular to the respective military, uh, ministries of defense, departments of defense, we need more of the J-codes to, to, to show up. It, it's been sporadic at times. They are invited. But too often we have many, many folks who assess that, well, information is, that, that's for the information folks. That's for the J39, for instance, to do, or the cyber stuff's for the cyber folks. That, that is not the case. Planners need to understand how to integrate this. Folks doing exercises need to understand how to integrate and test the theories of this, not just moving hardware around. The Intel community can participate by understanding what they need to provide to support and then what they can gain from this in a shared understanding. These are not to be separated silos. It really is an integrated function. So from an operational to low strategic level, across the J-codes are more than welcome to come participate because warfare is cognitive at its core. And commanders understanding that and participating in that is absolutely meaningful across their staffs to do that. Yes, there are practitioners specific in the field, just like we have air power theorists and enthusiasts and space power theorists but they have to come together in an integrated way. And oh, by the way, the information fight is in space, airspace, subsea, all of it as well. So that's that's what I would offer in that in terms of who else we'd like to see. And then just to offer a, a, a final analogy, wrapping up this, this question, I think, is a flower. Now we have the aspects, you know, stem, 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 but a stem, as important as it is, in terms of theory of application of kind of those quote unquote hard sciences is dead without the flower. It's dead without the arts. It's dead without the roots. We need the totality of that. The roots that Austin mentioned of where you place down, we need the STEM to be strong in this and participate, you know, electronic warfare and cyber sciences, but we need the arts and the beauty of the arts as well, because the flower is what propagates the flowers, right? And it's the beauty of the plant that really shines forth. And so it really is that collaborative effort, a classical liberal arts approach to tackling this. That's the sort of tent that we're looking to build of people working together to help solve these problems. So if there is you know, somebody listening to this podcast and, and they're inspired and are, are wanting to uh, uh, plug in more to, to this effort, um, good news, uh, there is another Phoenix Challenge Conference coming up later this spring. Could you guys give a quick preview of what we're likely to be seeing? So lucky for them, it straddles spring and summer. It's right over the solstice. The 20th to the 23rd of June in Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia Tech Research Institute is hosting the facilities and some of the background in a partnership uh, to support this effort they're gonna serve as the watering hole this time. And it's gonna be an academically focused conference that still brings together industry and government, 
but really looking to orient the academic community to be able to move forward in this space. That's the next large in-person meeting with Phoenix Challenge to be able to come together. We've started the planning of that now. We've got the dates set and there'll be a whole lot more to follow. And not just a plug, but I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. Anybody who's interested can reach out to me there. I'm happy to answer the questions or to keep them posted as this comes up. And I know you'll see Austin posting it. I know you'll see IPA posting. I know you'll see Arliss posting it. So follow Arliss, follow IPA, join IPA. Uh, I'm not a stock owner, but I think if you're an information professional, get involved, be a professional. That's what I would offer to stay plugged into the community and to start having that dialogue. And it's a very welcoming bunch. Uh, there's, there's nothing you need to, to join other than a desire to be part of this community of interest and really work together at moving it forward. Uh, Austin? Thanks, Andy. And thanks, John, for, uh, for hosting us and inviting us to have this conversation. All right. Excellent. Well, uh, as, as Andy said, uh, yeah, please follow IPA on LinkedIn. Uh, join IPA. Your uh, membership goes directly towards IPA pursuing its mission, engaging with Arliss and uh, all kinds of other great initiatives that uh, IPA has uh, for this year and going forward. And with that, uh, gentlemen, Andy Whiskeyman and Austin Branch, thank you so much for what you and your colleagues do. And thank you for being guests on The Cognitive Crucible. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.